Each of these Coffee Talk episodes features valuable insights from an independent expert on a wide range of IT topics. This one in particular is organized by the editors of redmondmag.com and sponsored by the folks at Zscaler. So thanks so much to Zscaler because without their support, this series and this episode in particular would not be possible. And of course, thanks to you for joining us. I'm Gladys Rama. I'm the editorial director of Converse 360, and I will be moderating today's episode, which is titled The Security Case Against VPN. Real quick before I introduce our first speaker, um, a bit of housekeeping. This episode is being recorded for later access, so you'll be able to get a link from us in your inbox in a couple of days that you'll be um, that you can where you can listen to this recording at your leisure. Second, we are making some time during this talk for questions. So at any time, if you have any questions during any of our presentations, do throw your questions into the Q&A console, and we're going to try to get to as many of those as possible. Third, Zscaler has generously provided a bunch of extra resources for you related to this topic. They're available also right now on your console, so check those out. And finally, as a small thank you, uh, the first 200 attendees who stick with us to the end will be receiving a $5 gift certificate to Starbucks. So now it's time to meet our first speaker, Brian Posey. Hey, Brian. It's, glad. it's really good to have you back for this topic. Um, if you guys don't know Brian, he's written and contributed to dozens of IT books, numerous full-length video training courses, and he's a, a, a workhorse columnist for ResinMag.com. He's published thousands of columns on a huge variety of IT topics, so check them out um, in his long-running Posey Tips and Tricks column. You're in for a great session. Brian, as I mentioned, it's great to have you back. Take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Gladys. Hello, greetings, and welcome, everyone. So today we're going to be talking all about the security problems associated with VPNs. And i got to tell you, this is actually a topic that has been on my mind for quite a while um, because there's a lot of hype surrounding VPNs, and some of the hype is justified, some maybe not so much. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So to get started, I want to point out that VPNs are a legacy technology. Now, that might seem really weird to say that being that VPNs are as popular as they are and they're something that's so widely used today. But VPNs have been around for a long, long time. VPNs were actually first created way back in 1996 by Microsoft, and at the time they used the PPTP, or Point-to-Point -point Tunneling Protocol. Now keep that protocol in mind because I'm going to be mentioning that a little bit later on in the presentation. Now, for the first few years that VPNs were around, they were largely an experimental technology. Uh, the first VPN specification wasn't published until 2000. And then businesses started really catching on to VPN use in the early 2000s. As far as practicality in the real world, uh, the first time that I ever remember seeing a VPN was, oddly enough, at the Windows 2000 launch party. Uh, somebody from Microsoft pulled me aside and showed me a demo of a VPN back then. So that was probably late 1999, early 2000, if I had to guess. And the first time I ever saw one in production use was probably somewhere around 2003. So if you figure that we're going into 2024, VPNs have been around for over 20 years. So that's why I say that I consider them to be a legacy technology. Now, having said that, there are several different types of VPNs. All VPNs are not created equally. Now, I'm assuming that most of the people on this call are probably aware of the differences between VPN types. But even so, the different types of VPNs are going to play a role in the remainder of this presentation. So I'm, I just want to take a couple of minutes and talk about the different VPN types just for the benefit of anybody who might not um, be familiar with them. So the first type of VPN is something that's generally called a site-to-site -site VPN, but there's a few different names uh, because these can hold a few different roles. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as cloud VPNs or always-on VPNs, but their, their role is to connect two separate sites together. Uh, this might be an organization's corporate office and a branch office. It might be an office and a resource in the cloud. But the whole goal is to connect two separate resources together so that that way you provide a private tunnel between those two locations. Because without that, the alternative would be to subscribe to a leased line and send all of the traffic across that dedicated line, which does have its advantages, but it's also very costly. So using a site-to-site -site VPN is a less expensive alternative to using a leased line. 
Uh, the second type of VPN is a remote access VPN. This is the type that most of us are probably the most familiar with. It's what's used to provide end users with remote access to an organization's network. We saw this used heavily back during the pandemic. All of a sudden, everybody was forced to work from home, and m most users probably used a remote access VPN to connect to the organization that they worked for so that they could continue working normally, even though they were at home. And then the third type of VPN is a personal VPN. This is a consumer-grade solution, and it's used primarily for privacy. Now, now, there are, or excuse me, there is some overlap between all three types of VPNs that I've discussed, but I'm, what I'm going to be talking about throughout this presentation is going to pertain mostly to personal VPN and remote access VPN. So let's take a look at how VPNs work at a really high level. And this particular example pertains to personal VPNs, although there is a bit of overlap, as I mentioned, with some of the other VPN types. So the very first thing that happens is that the client has to contact a VPN server. So the client is just a user working from a device that can be just about any device type, and there's a software client component that's been installed on that device. So the user opens up that client, they enter some authentication credentials, and then they connect to a VPN server. And then that VPN server establishes what's called a tunnel. It's basically just an encrypted session between itself and the client. So at that point, any traffic that the client generates gets directed through that tunnel to the VPN server. Now, there are a few exceptions to that, such as split tunneling and things like that, but that's the simple explanation. Now, what happens when that traffic reaches the server? Well, that VPN server acts as a proxy. So, in other words, if the end user tries to go to a website, well, then that HTTP or HTTPS request is going to get sent across the tunnel to the VPN server rather than going directly to the website that it would normally go to. Then that VPN server intercepts that request and it reissues the request to the website that the user is trying to reach. So it's the VPN server, not the user, that ultimately communicates with that website. So the, the request gets sent to the website, the website responds to that request, that response gets sent to the VPN server, and then that VPN server relays that request back across the tunnel to the user who was accessing the website. So that's a really high-level explanation of how a consumer-grade VPN works. So why does all of this matter? Well, we're talking about the security downsides to VPNs. And so you really have to stop and think about what the way that a VPN works really does for that consumer. Well, at a fundamental level, there are two things that are accomplished. One, the VPN masks the end user's IP address. Because remember, when the user tries to access a website, they send the request to the VPN server, and then the VPN server reissues that request and then sends that request to the website. So the website never communicates directly with the end user. So what that means is that from the website's perspective, all of those requests that are coming in come from the VPN server's IP address, not from the user's IP address. So the website can't tell what IP address the end user is actually at. Another thing that it does is it masks the end user's location because location information is often tied from an IP address. Now, in all fairness, there are other ways that the user's location can be derived, so this part isn't foolproof. But because the end user's IP address is masked, then what that means is that if the website that the user is communicating with uses IP address as a means of determining the user's location, well, then that location gets masked simply because the IP address is masked. And this has a variety of uses. It can be used for privacy, but it can also be used as a way of accessing resources that would normally be off limits due to the user's location. Uh, for example, there are some television content providers in Canada that restrict their content to Canadian or they will only allow their content to be accessed by Canadian citizens. So people outside of Canada can use a Canadian VPN server to mask their IP address to make it look like they're in Canada as a way of gaining access to that content. So consumer VPNs are generally used as a means of enhancing online privacy and security. But the problem with that is that what users ultimately end up with in many cases, and I'm not saying all cases, but many cases, is a false sense of security. And the big reason for that is because VPN advertisements tend to be really misleading. 
Now, I'm not saying that every VPN company out there misleads its customers on what it can actually do and what they can realistically expect in terms of privacy and security. But if you've ever turned on the TV or the radio and you've heard a VPN commercial, you've probably heard an example of a VPN company really overhyping its capabilities. And interestingly, there was a report that was put out by Consumer Reports recently, and I've cited several quotes from that report throughout this presentation, but the first quote that I want to give you is, we confirmed what many security experts have said for years. The industry's privacy and security practices often don't live up to its marketing. So that just kind of underscores what I had said about the misleading advertisements for VPN companies. So then elsewhere in the report, Consumer Reports goes on to say, we found that 12 out of the excuse me, we found that 12 out of 16 of the VPNs we looked at either inaccurately represented their products and technology or made hyperbolic or overly broad claims about the kinds of protection they provide their users. These claims, combined with a consistent stream of news reports about security breaches, can lead people to worry more than necessary about banking online or visiting websites that are already encrypted using HTTPS. They can also give VPN users a false sense of security if they don't realize that their protections offered are not comprehensive. And then a little bit further down, the report goes on to say hyperbolic claims of overpromising by VPNs are not only unethical but also dangerous because it can lead to forestering a false sense of security. So what these quotes are really getting at is that consumer VPNs can be a double-edged sword from the standpoint of security. On one hand, they may be completely unnecessary because if you're accessing an, uh, your bank online or some other uh, service that provides sensitive information, well, then your encryption to that institution is already, or excuse me, your connection to that institution is already encrypted by the HTTPS protocol. So is there a need to encrypt it again using a VPN tunnel? Well, probably not because you're already using nice solid encryption. But the flip side to that is that whereas a VPN might be unnecessary in some situations, it can also provide a, um, a false sense of security. And the reason why that's problematic is because even though there may not be a whole lot of benefit to using a VPN for accessing things like online banking and stuff like that, having that false sense of security can cause a user to engage in behavior that's maybe a little bit more risky than they would ordinarily engage in if they didn't feel protected by a VPN. So that VPN can give them that false sense of security and make them feel invincible, leading them to take unnecessary risks while online. So another problem with VPNs is that the security and privacy measures that are offered by VPN providers can potentially be completely ineffective. Now, I use the word potentially. I'm not saying that this is an absolute and that it happens in every case, but it could. So one of the big reasons why people use VPNs is for privacy, because as I pointed out, the VPNs will shield your IP address, and the tunnel also makes it so that your ISP can't see what's going on. But beyond that, people will use VPNs as a way of tracking uh, activity that they really don't want seen. So that might be doing something illegal and trying to hide it from law enforcement. It might just be that they're concerned about privacy and that they don't want their ISP or data brokers or whoever snooping on them. It could be totally innocent activity. They just like their privacy. But regardless, there are ways that various organizations have found to get around the privacy measures that are put in place by a VPN. So let's suppose that you're logged into a browser, you're connected to a VPN, and that you're accessing a particular website. Well, one of the problems with that is that many browsers out there actually give you the opportunity to log into the browser. And once logged in, you stay logged in until you consciously make an effort to log out of that browser. So if you're logged into a browser, well, then that browser knows about all of the activities that have happened through that browser, regardless of whether you're using an, a VPN or not. Another issue is that m many websites require a login. You know, I, I know for myself, I've probably got a couple hundred different logins for various websites, and I'm sure you're no different. But the problem with that is that if you're accessing one of those websites through a VPN and you log into that website, well, at that point, you're no longer anonymous. And then another issue is that 
I mentioned that you can use a VPN as a means of hiding your location because of the use of IP addresses. But an IP address isn't, isn't the only means of tracking a user's location. There's a component called the location service that can track your location independently of an IP address. So simply masking your IP address doesn't necessarily mask your location. <clears throat> so to that end, uh, Consumer Reports goes on to say, many VPNs have promised complete anonymity or untraceability or protection from advertisers, governments, and criminals. However, advertisers and governments are both able to track people in many ways not involving their IP address, which is what the VPN obfuscates. And your data can be compromised through phishing, malware, and various other methods that VPNs can't address. So essentially, Consumer Reports is saying what I just said on the previous slide, that so you're masking your IP address, it doesn't necessarily matter because there are other ways of getting the same location information that would normally be derived through an IP address. So what about malware protection? Well, one of the big claims that a lot of the consumer-grade VPN providers make is that their VPNs are able to protect their customers from malware. Now, you have to stop and think about this claim because a VPN is really just an encrypted network connection, as I pointed out on the slide earlier in this presentation. It's just a network connection, nothing more, nothing less. So if you think about a VPN in that term, well, what that really boils down to is the fact that a VPN doesn't provide any inherent benefit in the war against malware. Now, having said that, it is possible that some VPN providers may perform inline malware scanning as a part of the proxy relay process. Because remember, when a client establishes a connection to a VPN server, that VPN server intercepts the client's traffic, repackages it, and then sends it to whatever the destination was. So it's possible they may integrate malware scanning in that repackaging process. But that's kind of an add-on from the VPN provider. It's not something that's an inherent part of all VPNs by any stretch of the imagination. So what about VPN privacy? Because that really is one of the main reasons why consumers use VPN, is to avoid all of the online spying and snooping and tracking. Well, when, when a consumer uses a VPN, yes, they hide their online activities from their ISP. The ISP only sees that they're using a VPN. The websites they visit do potentially have a way of determining the user's location and identity, but activity is hidden from the ISP. And the reason why that matters to so many consumers is because ISPs are notorious for taking users' online activity and selling that to data brokers. So with that in mind, one has to consider the, the possibility that even though activity is hidden from an ISP, it's not hidden from the VPN provider. And a VPN provider could theoretically take all of that browsing history information and direct sell to the data brokers, essentially contacting those brokers and saying, hey, you know, everybody's using a VPN these days, so you're not getting as much data from ISPs, but hey, we can give you all of the data that you're missing out on. And so then they turn around and sell that information to advertisers, law enforcement, and anybody else who wants it. So Consumer Reports actually weighed in on this. Uh, they said, and I quote, we analyzed privacy policies to determine whether VPNs use their customers' personal data for purposes beyond just delivering the VPN service. And we looked at how much control users have over their data. This is a blind spot for many consumers in the University of Michigan survey, about 40% of respondents didn't know that VPNs collect personal data about them that could be used for marketing. We found problems in four of the broad privacy topics we looked at. So Consumer Reports is essentially admitting that there is a potential for VPN providers to sell information to data brokers. There's another website out there called Win Scribbles. Now, admittedly, I'm not familiar with this website. I have no way of knowing if this website is credible. But I read an article out there that was called The Lies You Were Told by VPN Companies. And I don't have any way of knowing if the claims that were made within the article were accurate, but they're really interesting nonetheless. And the article pertains to ways that information could potentially be sold by VPN companies. So it's something that I would recommend taking a few minutes and reading if, you're, if you have a moment. So what about the potential for VPN providers to log your online activities? Because even if the VPN providers aren't selling what you do online to data brokers, 
if they compile a log of your activities, that's potentially just as bad because anybody could theoretically get a hold of those logs. So there's a website called VPN, uh, V-E-E-P-N dot com, and they said if the police have a warrant, they have the authority to request information about you from your Internet Service Provider, or ISP, and your VPN provider. Here's how it works. The police go to your ISP and ask for information such as your IP address, but if you're using a VPN, your ISP can't see your information. It's encrypted. Instead, they'll see that you're using a VPN and direct the police to your VPN provider. Whether your VPN provider will give up your information depends on different factors, like laws in the area and the VPN provider's privacy policy. So that's why logs matter, because if there is a warrant and the VPN provider has a log of everything that you've ever done online, well, then there's a good chance that they could give up that log to law enforcement. Another thing that I hardly ever hear anybody talk about is the potential for a VPN provider to have security vulnerabilities. And all of these bullet points come from consumer reports. Uh, the first one being, we also found that one VPN, IT Vanish, was using the deprecated point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, which has security or has serious security flaws and has not been state-of-the-art since the 90s. Now, you'll recall that at the very beginning of this presentation, I talked about VPN being a legacy technology. And the first VPN being introduced in 1996 and using the point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. That protocol was found to have some serious security issues, and it's pretty easy to beat the encryption that PPTP uses. So new tunneling protocols have come out many, many years ago. And yet there's one VPN provider out there that still uses PPTP. So just something to think about. Uh, the next point, we also found that only one VPN, Mulvada, I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced, uses a security to authenticate its Windows updates, and just two, IP or IVPN and PIA use checksums as data integrity for them, which means that users of the other VPNs have no way of knowing whether an update is official or has been tampered with. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret this point because there's two things it could mean. One possibility is that it means that if a user does a Windows update while they're connected to the VPN, that the VPN doesn't take steps to confirm the authenticity of that update and just allows the user to download the update and install it without knowing if it's malicious or if it's been tampered with or anything like that. That's one possibility, and that's actually the possibility that I'm a little bit less worried about because most users do updates through Windows Update, which does do integrity checks on the updates that it downloads from Microsoft. The other possibility is that this may be saying that these VPN providers aren't checking the integrity of the updates that they're installing on their own servers meaning that they could potentially be downloading and installing updates that have been compromised. And that's a whole lot more problematic. And again, I'm not sure which of those two possibilities this particular point is referring to. Uh, the next thing, six VPNs we looked at were vulnerable to brute force attacks and account lockouts. Three VPNs allow 30 password attempts without triggering any kind of defense, such as implementing CAPTCHA. So that makes it really easy for someone to guess at VPN passwords. There was a study several years ago, and I apologize I didn't look this up ahead of time because I hadn't planned on talking about it. I'm just kind of going off the top of my head. But there was a study that one of the universities did um, maybe six or seven years ago, and that study found that if you know a user's two most recent passwords, then there's a super high probability that you can guess their current password within, I think it was 11 guesses. And this is saying that a lot of VPN providers will allow up to 30 guesses. Uh, before they take action. So if a cyber criminal happens to know something about the user whose account they're trying to compromise, there's a really good chance that they might be able to get in using those 30 yeses. Uh, then the slide goes, to, goes on to say half of the VPNs that we looked at did not have current publicly available third-party security audits of their core products, and that only four VPNs mentioned internal security audits in their documentation and only one stated that it publishes summaries of internal security audits. So what those last two points essentially boil down to is that we don't really have a way of knowing whether or not the VPN providers are operating in a secure manner. So what about remote access VPNs? These are the ones that are used by corporations to allow their employees to remotely access the networks. And they work very, very similarly to the consumer-grade VPNs that I've been talking about except that rather than relaying requests to the Internet, 
they relay requests to the corporate network, thereby allowing the remote user to access resources on that network as though they were directly connected to it. So in order to understand why this type of VPN can be problematic, you have to stop and consider the history of Wi-Fi. Now, I know that's a really weird thing to say that you need to consider, but there is a method to the madness. Because there was a time, uh, typically the late 90s, when organizations went to great lengths to control the physical devices that were connected to their networks. At the time, I worked for a large insurance company. And this insurance company actually went to the lengths of checking every single jack, and I'm talking network jack, in the entire building and cutting the wires on any jack that an authorized device wasn't plugged into. They were that serious about keeping unauthorized devices off their network. So you can imagine, being that organizations commonly went to those lengths to protect against unauthorized devices, how much Wi-Fi scared them when it first came out. Because with Wi-Fi, a user didn't even have to be in the building. They could be across the street and connect to their network. And that may be an authorized device. It might be an unauthorized device. They didn't know. The problem was shadow IT, because users loved wireless networks. So a lot of times, users would come in, unplug their computer from the network jack in their office, plug in an access point, and boom, the organization had a wireless network that they were totally oblivious to. And so that caused a lot of problems. Um, the big problem with Wi-Fi is that anybody who knew the Wi-Fi password could connect to the network. And worse yet, early Wi-Fi implementations had vulnerabilities so that anybody who could capture enough data could decrypt the Wi-Fi password. So the solution was that companies put into place a system that isn't really all that different from the way that VPNs work today. So a user would connect to a Wi-Fi network, but then there was an authentication mechanism that they had to pass through before they could gain access to the network. And I'm talking the wired network. So that meant that the user had to know the Wi-Fi password, but they also had to know the authentication password. And then if the user was able to fulfill these two requirements, then they were given access to the wired network. Now, as I mentioned, that's very similar to the way that VPN is used today, but there's a couple of problems with this approach. One problem is that a remote user could be working from an unhealthy device, and yes, there are systems that can be put in place to do device health checks before allowing a device onto a corporate network, but not everybody uses those. And so think about the problems that could be posed by an unhealthy device. You know, a user could be connecting from a device that's missing updates. It might be running an ancient operating system. It could be infected with malware. During the pandemic, I heard about a lot of people connecting from shared devices. In other words, somebody would work from the same device that their kid uses in the evenings to download games from sketchy websites. Another problem, and potentially the biggest problem, is that once the user has completed that authentication process, at that point they're considered trustworthy. They're free to go anywhere on the network that they want and do anything that they have the permissions to do. And that's the big problem because at that point, the device is considered to be completely trustworthy, the user is considered to be trustworthy, and so nobody questions anything. And that flies totally in the face of zero trust principles. And a bigger reason why this is a problem is because it allows for lateral moves. Uh, lateral moves are a technique that cyber criminals often use to gain a foothold in an organization by compromising a device and then moving from device to device or from device to device, elevating their privileges along the way until they've accumulated sufficient privileges to launch an attack. So I tend to think of this access method as being analogous to a building with only a single security station. And we've all seen places like this. You walk in the front door, there's a guard or a receptionist, you check in, and then once you've checked in, you're considered to be trustworthy and you can roam the building at will. That's kind of the same thing that we're dealing with with the way that VPNs work today. So that once a user connects to that VPN and they've completed the authentication process, they're trusted and nobody questions anything. So you really have to stop and think about this. Um, so a user connecting through a VPN has access to the entire network. Now, that doesn't mean that they have access necessarily to certain data sets or certain applications. You know, those are controlled with access control lists, but they do have access to the network, and they can go anywhere on that network that they want. So you have to consider, is this really necessary? Because at the end of the day, what the user truly needs access to 
is data and applications, not necessarily the network. The network is just the conduit that gets them there. So does it really make sense to give users access to the entire network when what they really need is just access to a few applications? Probably not. It makes a lot more sense from a security standpoint to move those applications to the edge so that the user can access them without having to traverse the network. So if that sounds like um, an odd way of going about things, think about SaaS applications. And I'm talking about things like Microsoft 365 or Salesforce or any of the software as a service applications. When an organization subscribes to those uh, SaaS applications, the method isn't to launch a VPN connection and then connect to those applications, or connect to the application provider, browse their network, and then go launch the application. No, it doesn't work that way. The application provider sets up a web front end that the end users connect to, and only the front end can communicates with the back end. The end users never touch the back end network. And that's far more secure than allowing an end user to just have unlimited access to the back end network. And if you really think about it, some SaaS providers even take things a step further and use split tunneling VPN, meaning that um, the user doesn't, or if the user is connecting through a corporate VPN, then connections to the SaaS application totally bypass that VPN and just go straight to the application rather than being routed through the VPN, because that will help improve performance and decrease the load on the VPN. So with that said, I am about out of time. I'm actually a couple minutes over, but I want to open it up for some questions. Yeah, we do have a bunch of questions. Thanks, Brian, for <laughs> terrifying us all. <laughs> we have a we have a question here from Chris who uh, asked, given everything that you said, do VPNs offer any protection at all, or should we just skip it and do another method? Uh, that's a really tough one to answer. Um, at, at a bare minimum, VPNs will mask your activity from your ISP. Uh, that, that part is a given. Beyond that, it's going to depend heavily based on which VPN provider you're using and what it exactly it is that you're trying to do. Okay. Um, here's one from MJ. Realistically, how trustworthy do you think consumer VPNs are? Uh, I, my honest opinion is that it probably varies. I think that there are, and I, I don't want to name names, but I think there are probably a couple of VPN providers out there that are trustworthy. But I also think that there are some that would probably sell you out at the drop of a hat. So mm. I, I would say that if you're using a consumer-grade VPN, just assume that they can't be trusted. Um, you know, as a friend used to say, never do anything online today that could embarrass you tomorrow. <laughs> that's, that's a good rule of thumb, I think. Um, here we have a question from Mar, who, yeah, who asked, what VPN alternatives do you recommend for privacy? Uh, what VPN? I, I didn't quite catch that. Can you say that again? Oh, sure. What VPN alternative do you recommend for privacy? Uh, again, it really kind of boils down to what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, if you're working from SaaS applications, then you really don't need a VPN to communicate with those. So that would be one uh, alternative that you could use. Uh, as, as far as just general activity, um, I, I can't really think of a good one. Hmm. And a um, question from Edgar, and I'm very curious to hear what you'll think as well, Brian. Do you think that people will quit using VPNs anytime soon? And if I can add something, when do you think people will be able to let go of their VPNs? Wow, those are two very different questions. Uh, let, let me answer <laughs> the second part first. When do I think people could let go of their VPNs? If we're talking about consumer-grade VPNs, the time is now. Um, hmm. How, how soon do I think people will let go of them? Uh, probably not for quite some time, simply because the marketing message is so pervasive and people have been conditioned to think, okay, if I use a VPN, then that automatically makes me secure. Uh, I think that's going to be really hard to overcome just because there has been such relentless marketing and because people are hyper aware of all of the security breaches that have happened in recent years and all of the spying that goes on online. Right. And just because I saw a couple of questions to this effect, yes, these slides from Brian will be uh, available for viewing later. So 
uh, you'll be able to chew over this, mull over this, and uh, maybe slightly freak out about this and act on it <laughs> after, <laughs> after the presentation. <laughs> hey, thanks so much, Brian. That was a great presentation. I'm glad we got to hear from you on this topic. Great. Thank you for having me.